We live in a constantly changing world where the speed of information is changing how we think and act and connect with one another. When people in a society lose faith in their institutions, in God and in each other, the nation collapses. We need help rebuilding trust and tying it all together. Welcome to All That To Say, a podcast exploring the interrelatedness of all things in long form conversation. Hi, this is Jim Lyon at All That To Say, and we are so glad you've joined us for this podcast episode in our season three. I am so thrilled, actually, to have our guest today, and Shirley Hoogstra has one of the most influential voices, I believe, uh, in the country right now, especially addressing a very important part of our civilization, our culture, our country, our history, and that is the ministry, the projection, the trajectory, and the voice of Christian colleges and universities. She is the president of the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities. It's called CCCU. Shirley Hoekstra, welcome to All That to Say. Jim, I'm so glad to be on your program. Thank you for those kind words. I just feel it's such an important time in the world to be a Christian and to gather with you in this podcast and to lead my organization of Christian Colleges and Universities. I feel it's such purposeful work. I'm so excited to unpack this conversation, Shirley, because I think you have a personal story. I mean, your own pathway to your present post, I think, is fascinating. But before we get there, help our audience understand the dimensions. Uh, Maybe another word is the impact of Christian colleges and universities uh, in the world today. Yes. uh, Let me me just share that. There are actually 4,000 universities in the United States. A thousand of them claim some kind of faith-related history. They might have been faith-friendly. They might have been uh, uh, faith-started, faith-historical. But Christian colleges and universities make up a very influential sliver of that thousand. We have 140 of them in the U.S. that are faith-integrated, meaning you can't miss the beauty, the glory of God in that academic study. We have 10 campuses in Canada. Uh, Canada has a system that is like the European or British system where they're not used to private colleges like the the Mm -hmm. private colleges we have in the U.S. But the growing uh, edge of Christian education, of course, is in the world. So we have 19 countries with 30 campuses uh, from the Asian Rim, six private colleges in Australia, three in Haiti, um, on the European continent, in the global south, on the African continent, and it's because people want to have their intellectual life tied closely to their faith and values. So the colleges, the campuses you've described are all within the CCCU umbrella, or they just exist? They're all affiliated with CCCU. Yeah, these 185 plus colleges are all affiliated with the CCCU. Now, there are others, of course, that we would like to have in our association (laughs) that are not part of the CCCU yet, However, uh, it represents about 500,000 students every year, and it's about 90,000 faculty and staff. So there isn't any singular college system that has 500,000 students, but we have a movement that is consistently faith integrated, and it's 500,000 students. (laughs) That is jaw-dropping. 500,000, yeah, I mean, think is. about that. That is a huge population that is in this system of higher education. Yes. Yes. Extraordinary. And what are the parameters or maybe the definitions of a CCCU college? What, what makes them distinctive apart from other educational institutions? Well, uh, three things um, I would highlight. The first one is that they have all Christian faculty. Hmm. And so that makes a difference because uh, if you... If you promise families that they will have a faith integrated curriculum, you need to have people who can do that. And so that's all Christian faculty. The second thing is that they, that they um, are uh, have a Christian mission. So in addition to this Christian uh, product, they start with a Christian mission and that they have a global witness, meaning they are not self-centered. They're not just about getting a job. They're thinking about the kingdom of God broadly, this global witness, how do their graduates make an impact in the world? And I'm, I'm going to guess, no, I'm not guessing, I know, 
many students enrolled in these schools are not necessarily looking for a faith-based experience. Uh, they may be drawn for another reason. Why would someone uh, outside of a, a church-related history choose one of these schools? I think it's the particularly smart student that does that. And I'll tell you why. When you think about the world today, think about how much religion plays a role in conflict, plays a role in relief, giving uh, opportunities, plays a role in understanding the great classics, um, the way in which the world works uh, in a nonpartisan way. Religion is at the core of that. People um, who may not be Christians might think, I would like to go to a place where they still acknowledge objective truth. They might say, I'd like to go to a place where there is, in fact, an acknowledgement that there is a spiritual part of my life. So, so that, that's, that would be one way. And that's, of course, why Christians want to continue their education at a Christian college. They, they might be drawn in uh, to the fact that we just have excellent academics, mm -hmm. small classrooms, affordability. And they might think, ah, maybe I can miss that, that Christian stuff or maybe the God stuff I'll just ignore. The beauty of it is that it's taught in such a way that's inviting. We're not proselytizing. We're not beating people over the, the head. But it is so inviting to see mentors really respected and uh, extraordinary faculty and staff who love the Lord and are just inviting people to watch their lives, to ask important questions. And that's why people are attracted to it. As you're uh, unpacking those ideas, I couldn't help but remember uh, experience I had in my own family. Uh, I'm from Seattle, that's my home place. And uh, while I was in Seattle, I was pastoring before I took my present post here. And we decided, my wife and I, that we would open our home to a foreign exchange student and went through a program. It wasn't necessarily a Christian program, it just happened to be uh, knocking on our door. So long story short, this young man named Ken came from Tokyo to live in our home for a year. He was 19. And when I asked about his family and why, why they chose me, because they chose my house out of a portfolio of options, he said that his mother, who was a member of the Tokyo City Council, and his father, who was the chief executive at a large tire and rubber company in Japan, told him, he was not a believer, they were not, but said to him, you need to stay in a Christian home because that will be the key to understanding the world. And and help when you come back home, having lived with those people, you will have a much better grasp of how to navigate uh, the world of today. I thought it was really extraordinary, but there you are. It's a that's, similar kind of a dynamic. That's a fabulous phrase, um, navigate the world of today. And I'll just tell you a quick story about three people that your listeners might recognize. So um, there's Arthur Brooks, and he's in the Atlantic. He writes a lot about happiness. I think he's going to be the happiness guru <laughs> at some point. And he works at Harvard. And uh, David Brooks, not related, um, also he, you know, wrote The Road to Courage. He's on uh, PBS. People know him as a columnist. He teaches at Yale. Um, and then Russell Moore, many of our listeners would understand Russell Moore. He's a churchman uh, and uh, now is the editor of Christianity Today. He taught a class at University of Chicago. To a person, each one of those gentlemen relayed this story. Um, once the class that they were teaching, and it wasn't particularly um, meant to be a religious class, it was a, a class on culture or a class on happiness or a class on well-being, uh, once they knew that Arthur or David or Russell was a Christian, they would make, as you would expect, office hour appointments. And lo and behold, each man said they would start off maybe with the generalized questions like, what about this in the syllabus? And immediately went to the important questions of like, what do you believe about the end times? What do you believe about when I die? What do you believe um, should be my purpose in life? All really important spiritual questions and each one of those gentlemen said, in a secular campus, people are hungry to understand this, this uh, spiritual nature of the human being. Um, and then they had resources in those three gentlemen who are all uh, Christians. Yes. And uh, that would suggest that if you went to a, a CCU school, uh, you would have an environment like that all the time. It wouldn't be the random class. 
<laughs> that's the idea. Well, that's that's what you know, you're you're talking to someone who's a hundred percent biased towards Christian <laughs> yes, education. Yes, yes. I'm a grad, my children are grad, they married grads, and that's exactly right. Why have it be hit or miss? Why have it be the random faculty member or the random conversation or the random peer that you're sharing your life with? Why not choose? And, and this is from 18 to 22 and maybe your graduate work yeah, if you're a returning student. I just believe from 18 to 22, this is the time when you're leaving your parents' home, you're maybe questioning some of the things that you had to do and you want to claim them and own them as your own. Um, the big questions of life do come up in your courses. Why not have a role model and a, a guide for your life who shares your values and your faith and is going to put it out to you that God is real? Yeah. Right? That God is real. That is a big question for people today. Is God real? And in an optimum scenario, every discipline of knowledge would be framed by that reality. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, this when we talk about integration of faith and learning, and my association works with our campuses so that they can really hone this skill. When you graduate as a faculty member, uh, maybe you get your PhD from a secular institution, you really are well trained in your field, let's say biology. Um, and you, you take all of that really important depth of knowledge and you bring it to a Christian campus. All of our campuses have, I guess you might call it orientation or uh, practicum uh, and philosophical beginnings for those new faculties to say, now, how are you going to transmit the centrality of God into the biological information? Uh, take astronomy. You could teach astronomy and never mention God. Or astronomy is like the textbook for a God of a universe, right? How do you explain right, that? Or right. that uh, I'm a recent grandmother. Uh, and I think about, you You think about just the, the embryo that grows into a human that is going to be able to be a fully formed, reasoning, thinking, spiritual. Is this really random? Look at, just let me rant one more time. Look at your fauna and flowers. Look at the, the variety in creation. Can you really think that was random? Yeah, well... I'm sure you know of Francis Collins, until lately yes. the director of the CDC, and uh, I was in a room with him once where he was uh, saying what I know he said in other places about his uh, his research into the human genome. He's the father of the Human Genome Project, really, yes. or, or at least the leader of it, and and the helix of the DNA, and I, I was so struck by his description of it. He was like a, a, a young boy in a candy store, so excited, yes. still passionate about this. But he said, the complexity of human DNA is yes. so over the top. It cannot be comprehended by human imagination, even today, and that it will be generations and generations and generations if the world lasts before we unravel it all. And he wrote a book, using this phrase, he called it the language of God. And he actually said that you can study the cosmos. Of course, this is his bias. You can go to the farthest edges of an infinite universe. And, it, and he said to the effect, it's still child's play compared to the complexity and wonder of human DNA. And how could that have evolved by chance? Uh, right. He's not buying it. But to your point, yes. even in hard science or in softer sciences or in culture or literature, wherever you are with the human mind, having a foundation uh, of truth that, as you said, is objective, that provides a platform for exploration, uh, is really how the world has advanced in its knowledge. And the CCCU colleges, universities, campuses, are still a lead to that idea, that That's you right. can go farther, deeper, and more completely if you start with this premise, there is a God. Well, I was just in a conversation um, with a group of scholars from all different areas, um, uh, from the sciences, from the, the uh, psychology, uh, people were um, writers, humanists, and they were reflecting um, on the fact, and, and uh, some of these uh, scholars were from really ex extraordinary secular universities, Princeton, uh, Stanford, and they said the student of today just does not have any comprehension that there is, in fact, an objective truth. Mm -hmm. And this caused real difficulties in ethics classes. 
Because if we as human beings, as a society, as a world, we need to be able to think deeply about the ethics, think just about euthanasia, think about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, think about um, the CRISPR of the human uh, genome. All of these things just pose such huge ethical questions. If there is no standard, if there is no objective truth, that there, there are boundaries that must be observed because of objective truth, uh, our world is in trouble. And so Christian colleges and universities, by acknowledging that there is in fact objective truth, one of the most important places to find that objective truth is in the Holy Scriptures. And what a joy that is to be able to have that text where you can find objective truth. And what a joy it is then to share that. So we started this conversation about the fact that um, maybe a, a student comes to a Christian college who is not yet a Christian. But the opportunity to present those, those um, winsome truths to somebody and then have their life change forever and then their family's life change forever and maybe generations change forever uh, because that it is so appealing actually uh, to be able to center in a God of the universe who has set up the objective truth to how we are to live as human beings. How in the world did you get involved in a work like this? In other words, <laughs> where you're growing up and saying, you know, someday I'm going to be the voice of Christian colleges, and universities, <laughs> or well, what, what was your pathway to your present post? Well, I'm a part of a denominational heritage, which really believed in K through 12 Christian schools. Mm -hmm. And my parents um, are first generation immigrants. Um, my grandparents came over about a hundred years ago. They wanted a better life and more religious freedom. And, and they um, came from? I grew up, pardon? And they came from? Uh, the Netherlands. The Netherlands, okay. Um, I, yeah. Yes. And um, I grew up in a home where you sacrificed in order to meet your covenantal responsibilities to your children by sending them to K through 12 mm, school. Yes, right. My dad was on the school board. My mom was a PTA person. And uh, I, I grew up knowing from the time I was little, the, the beauty of having teachers that was, they were teaching me about God. They opened up their love of the Lord. Um, anyway, I then went on to a Christian college, Calvin University, Calvin College at the time. Uh, and I, I was so grateful that I had a developed worldview mm -hmm. uh, that I, uh, and then I became a, a school teacher and I was able to teach myself uh, with third and fourth grade uh, students and then junior high. I got to tell you, I love junior high and I'll tell you why I love junior high. Um, they are still goofy, but you can ask them to read and you can have a little quiet time. <laughs> well, I, but I'm just going to reflect. If you love teaching junior high, that proves there is a God. That is a calling, <laughs> unique and specific. But thank you for owning it. I, I I do love that junior high students. They are still able to be enthusiastic without being too self conscious. Mm -hmm. yes. um, and uh, and then I went on to law school, and I I did that because I wanted to prepare myself for whatever the Lord would call me to do. And he called me into high conflict litigation. Uh, my firm um, handled all the toughest cases in Connecticut, uh, whether they were criminal cases or matrimonial cases or um, uh, personal injury work. And um, I worked with Jewish uh, partners, Catholic partners and partners that did not have a faith. And I realized that it was my Christian college education that helped me sort of just explain my world mm -hmm. and explain why I wanted to help people in really tough situations. And, and it was because I saw that I was working for an audience of one, that I was to use my gifts and talents to bring shalom to the world. And what better way to bring shalom than to high conflict legal work? Um, I'll just go on a little bit. I was yes. a volunteer at Calvin University and um, I'll, I went on a women's retreat and at that women's retreat, I really was struck with the importance of obedience, of living a life of obedience. And I, I made some changes in my own work life in order to be what I thought was more obedient. So anyway, I, I get this prompting and, you know, I'm reformed. I'm not very Pentecostal, but it was definitely a prompting um, of the Holy Spirit. And uh, there was an opening to be the vice president of student life at Calvin University. And I said, you have the wrong number, Lord. It is sure not me. 
I'm a lawyer in New Haven, Connecticut. I don't plan to move back to Grand Rapids, Michigan. And it was so crystal clear that I was to apply. I'm like, Lord, I don't even know. I'm a board member. I like was an RA. That doesn't equip me to be the vice president of student life. I have a little leadership talent, but this doesn't equip me. And I just heard you got to apply. And I said, okay, hey, this is one of those tests. You know, kind of like you got to do it, but then the Lord says you don't have to do it. So I was like, hey, maybe I can apply. And they'll say no. And then it will be a win-win. I can stay where I'm at, but I've been obedient. Well, they didn't say that. And here's what happened, Jim. I was being prepared for this job right now at the CCCU. My job requires me to have a law background. We do so much in the advocacy world. We file 80 amicus briefs. We are in a court case in in the Ninth Circuit um, uh, in Washington State. And I needed to know campuses. And the The beauty of it is that while I was the vice president for 15 years on a campus, all the hot button issues are issues I dealt with firsthand. And I was a volunteer for the very organization I head up now. And the Lord just brought this full circuit. And if I remember back when he said you should apply for that job at a college, I'm like, what in the world? I want to be a judge. I'm on deck. I think my firm can get me to be a judge in, in Connecticut. What am I doing being a vice president at a college in Grand Rapids, Michigan? What are you doing, Lord? I thought for the first three years, I'm going to quit. I'm going to go back. I'm going to afford it. And just like, you know, good thing there was no fish to swallow me. Anyway, <laughs> I end up here today and I feel, Jim, that I am doing, if I'm a car and I have a six-cylinder engine, I am using all six cylinders. And I tell this to students who are, um, graduating from college, I say, risk more, pray more, worry less. Extraordinary. And I'm, I'm an advocate of a concept that the Lord doesn't waste anything. Yes, and even yes. when we're not conscious of how yes. the threads are being woven together, you find yourself every now and then looking backwards and saying, oh my goodness, I could have never imagined uh, this choice profiting me in, in a healthy way for this moment. And and your story reflects that. But I, I'm a guy who went to law school also. And oh, you I, did? I, I okay. did. Yes, well, I never practiced law. You you really got into the game. I, I jumped out before I, I did. But uh, I was I was struck by your sense that you felt like you should go to law school uh, because I don't know, you, you were drawn to preparing yourself for mm-hmm. something uh, I went to law school, honestly, because I wanted to be in government. And at the time, I felt like that was the only graduate school for public service, so to speak. And so I went. Um, I never imagined myself going into the ministry, which is ultimately how I landed. But uh, and another piece of my story is I, I, I'm a graduate of Seattle Pacific University. And while I was there, there was a guy, a Presbyterian pastor named John Huffman. And he was, at the time, the he was Richard Nixon's pastor in Key Biscayne Presbyterian Church. Okay, so I'm disclosing I'm a really, really old man. But he came to the campus. He had become kind of a, a phenom on the stage because Richard Nixon, the president of the United States, was in his parish. Anyway, he spoke at the, at the uh, chapel series, uh, a week of chapel meetings on my campus. I'll never forget him saying that he had gone to law school. Uh, he went to the University of Pittsburgh, and he had planned to be a lawyer and and how that prepared him for Mm -hmm. a career in the ministry in a way he could have never imagined. Yes. At that time, I thought, wow, I'm going to go to law school too. I was a senior in political science, uh, went on to the University of Washington Law School. But I thought, oh, I'll never be a pastor, but wow, I'm, here's, a, here's a smart guy who loves Jesus who went to law school. I'm just giving all that story because I was grabbed in my own journey by your testimony. You went to law school. Tell me something about law school. In addition to just kind of understanding how the law works, is there a skill or a, an understanding or a way in which you pursue an idea that you, you captured in law school that now is working for you? Yes. What do you think? Um, uh, the law school is preparation for problem solving. Mm-hmm. And so you the case study method is where you take all the problems that have happened in the law, you look at them, you unpack them, you dissect them, you say, what would you do differently? What did they do right? Um, and then you, you um, become actually comfortable in problem solving situations. And this has been a great help. Uh, 
because you, first of all, you know how to work through a problem. Um, you know how to do the analysis of a problem. And then the second skill that you have is you know how to defend or argue for a point of view. Um, and I also think that lawyers tend to stay objective. And I think that makes us good listeners. Uh, so even in the work that I do today, where I am in a polarized political environment in Washington, D.C., uh, Christians are not held necessarily in the highest esteem. And I'm not put off by that. I think, oh, this is a problem. We can solve this problem. Here are some arguments we can make. Here are some tactics we can do. Um, and I, I, I truly realize that not only do you need the law on your side, which are the rules, mm -hmm. but you need the facts on your side. Because uh, let, let's just take that the fact that I believe that Christian mission should be protected by the Constitution. Well, that's the rule. And let's, let's make sure everybody remembers the rule. But if you don't have the worthiness of Christian institutions to be protected, then you're, you may have a rule, but you don't have the heart mm -hmm. to say, yes, you know, Christian organizations, they're the first to help with relief. They're the first in foster care. They're the first in making sure that life has dignity. They're the first in wanting immigration reform that's legally done to help hurting people. They're the first to say that we should be giving aid to famine victims, right? Because we have this human dignity worldview, uh, Christians are, are should be at the front of the line making the world better, which is why you want to make sure that Christians can thrive, which is why you want to make sure the Constitution is upheld. That's all extraordinary. And I just have to reflect to you that I... I was prepared for law school at Seattle Pacific, and, and I had a professor named William Hansen, and I was a wallflower. I didn't like talking in front of a crowd, but I had in my head somehow that I was going to go into politics. I don't know, again, it's bizarre. But in, in the school, Dr. Hansen taught a series of classes. One was called rhetoric. The other was parliamentary, uh, parliamentary procedure and argumentation. Another was um, uh, pu American public address. Anyway, it was a series of classes I took with Dr. Hansen. And in all of that, he, he made the same case, which really set me up uh, for law school. And he actually wrote my most glowing you know, recommendations to the yes. committee of review and my application is about how to own an idea and identify just what every law student knows in a brief. You have to establish the facts, then you identify what are the issues that arise from the facts, and here's the remedy. I mean, that's the yes. basic outline, isn't it? And yes. he gave that to me even as an undergrad, but grounded in this knowledge, Jim, if you're going to prevail in a case, you have to believe uh, in the, the moral order. Yes. to be able to navigate to a conclusion. And of course, in law school, you learn sometimes you have to defend uh, people who, whom you may not have sympathy, uh, but there's a certain uh, framework of everyone has certain rights and so on, and they need to be exercised. Long story short, your your description of, of, of law school empowering you now to help make that case to help identify the facts, remind people what the facts are. And, and of course, I would say the person who's able to frame the issue is the one that will prevail. That's always the case. You are, you are, it's who gets to, who gets to set the question? What is the question? That's right. And, and back to Christian colleges and universities, that's a part of the underlying uh, foundation, isn't it? To help people yeah. figure out what the issues are right. properly. So yes. that remedy fairly. and advance and fairly, fairly. yeah, and, yes. and and just so that civilization can move forward. Because if you if you don't get the issue right at the beginning, the outcomes can't be right. That's correct. Now, okay, and so Christian, go. So in, 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 at Christian colleges, hopefully, and this is actually a, a known fact, Christian colleges are less politically correct. Therefore, they have the most diverse conversations in the classroom. Hmm. If you ask the man on the street. Uh, do you think that Christian colleges uh, are, are asking all of the big questions or thinking about all of the potential answers or studying all of the diverse? Um, they, would, they wouldn't say it. They think it's narrow. That's right. But actually what's happened on secular campuses, it's gotten narrow because there's only one right answer. Whereas at Christian colleges, we say, look, all of life is under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. What should we be thinking here? Less fear, 
more courage. And that is a, a benefit of going to a Christian college. And the more we remind our students, uh, and of course, love casts out fear, the more we remind our, our students to love God and love their neighbor, they have less fear. Therefore, they're better problem solvers, or hopefully so. Absolutely, and unafraid to ask the hard questions. That, unafraid to ask the hard that questions, should right. be, That should be the case. I'm that sure there are some case. classrooms where that may not be playing out so well. But, That's right. But in again, the ideal. The ideal, and, and that ideal has a chance in a Christian campus. Well, think about how countercultural Jesus was, right? He engaged women, he gave, engaged sinners, he talked to the, um, uh, the tax collector, um, and uh, he... he talk differently about, I mean, all the things that we know about Jesus was willing to ask different questions to your point about framing the issue. Mm -hmm. So if our role model ideally is Jesus, and if you can study Jesus best in a Christian college, this just gives you a leg up in every endeavor you might be called into. I certainly felt it that way when I became a lawyer. Um, I felt that I had a set of tools on my tool belt that was broader than those who did not have that faith worldview perspective. How would you uh, define the, what shall I say, the, three, uh, the theological framework of CCCU schools, differentiated from some other schools that might have some faith basis? But I mean, is there a, a screener scrub? Or uh, is a Catholic university in the mix, for instance? Are, are, are there so, boundaries? What would you say? Uh, so, uh, um, CCCU schools are committed to being countercultural. Um, one place that shows up is in the human sexuality range. Um, another is that uh, people make sacrifices in terms of uh, being at institutions that not, might not pay them the same as if you go to a large research one university. Um, they also have to, uh, they sign a commitment to treat each other fairly. So if you live in a state that has eight or nine Christian colleges, what you agree to do is to not badmouth or mm. say, we're really the Christian college. Those <laughs> yes. are the ones we're the more we're, Christian. <laughs> we're the more Christian college. Yeah. You, you uh, pledge to be collegial uh, with your neighbor. And with enrollment being fought after, think about how that does take a Christian commitment to say, uh, we are not playing those games. Yeah. Um, so Catholic universities have their own association. Catholic universities, almost almost all, are very concerned about what the Catholic mission is, and that's very definable. But they may no longer have all Christian or all Catholic faculty. Mm -hmm. So our real distinctive is in the fact that you will be assured that your faculty member, your staff member, is a committed Christian who can lead and guide and interpret um, and uh, really shape your experience within that Christian framework. I know that a lot of what you do is advocacy. Mm -hmm. uh, we've we've uh, hinted on that in the conversation already. You you are standing up uh, for the rights or the the agency of a Christian campus to survive and thrive in our country today, which is increasingly uh, diverse, the country and its values, its ethics, its approach to life, uh, different maybe than uh, earlier years in the country when many schools were founded. And, and so you play an important role uh, in Washington, D.C., for instance, where a lot of the rules are made. You have a home mm -hmm. in Grand Rapids. Uh, you, that whole Calvin University trip has planted you there. But you also have a residence in D.C. because so much of your work is done there. My guess is that you have to build alliances and, you know, speaking about Catholic universities, I'm sure there are many front lines where you stand shoulder to shoulder uh, for, for certain uh, outcomes. Tell me a little bit about that work. And uh, you're in the yeah. House of Congress. People know you by name when they're dealing with legislation. What is it Some about? Some of my most, my, my most enjoyable work is the uh, making friends and allies for Christian education. And uh, sometimes they look like strange bedfellows. Yes. Uh, and I, I take the Great Commission, love God and love your neighbor, and go therefore and make disciples. Kindness leads to repentance. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Mm -hmm. I hope those verses 
uh, allow me a posture of humility. Um, and my life verse is always be prepared to give the hope that you have in Christ Jesus. Hmm. So uh, I, I, that's just kind of a mash. Yes. Um, and it, it all comes together. So let's say that uh, I'm, I've been getting a lot of calls recently to be part of discussions around democracy building. Mm -hmm. People are concerned that the polarization, the inability to speak together, the lack of civility uh, is really bad for democracy. And I think we would agree it is. And so they, they think that maybe Christians have some skills or beliefs or tools that might make them interesting conversation partners. So I try to be at that table every chance that I get. Um, another group of individuals around our religious freedom work is I have come to so love and respect my Jewish colleagues. Um, the Orthodox Jewish Union is one of our very significant uh, religious liberty partners. Our Catholics um, and our Jesuits are very important in that work, as well as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Seventh-day Adventists, the AND campaign. Um, we then pair up with an LGBT group called the American Unity Fund, uh, which um, has as its head uh, an almost Christian college grad, but who really believes that LGBT rights should not come at the expense of religious liberty rights. Now, some people say, really, should you hang out with all those folks? And I go, oh, I'm so blessed to hang out with those folks. I hang out with a lot of journalists. Uh, who really wonder about what we're doing. And they don't always write friendly, but I, I think they write more friendly because of our relationships. So um, I try to do things on behalf of our Christian colleges so that people say, I know a Christian, and they seem to want people to flourish, not at the expense of other people's flourishing. Mm -hmm. So with that set up actually can you illustrate give, give us an idea an issue a le some legislation in the offing or that you've already addressed uh, that that built this collaborative uh, collegial style of, of, a, of a very diverse collection of people defending a common goal how would yeah. you illustrate that so when i think about um, making sure that our institutions can practice their faith without coercion I look in four areas of vigilance. The first area is the courts. What cases are coming up and what are going to, what's going to be in a, a Supreme Court of the United States or in an important state court? Um, what is the legislature doing that can affect? Higher education is highly regulated. Uh, I, I can't, I don't have to say it here, but we, uh, there's regulations about housing and food and athletics and, um, uh, non-discrimination, et cetera. They, um, the third area is the executive branch. So the Department of Education, the Department of Justice, the Art of um, Health and Human Services, they all regulate us. And the fourth area is business and media. Um, and so I'm always surveying what's happening there. So let me, let me just uh, give you a little, little story about what's called the, the Equality Act. Um, the Equality Act was a civil rights bill that sought to amend the 1964 Civil Rights Act, so that when we use the word sex, it would include sexual orientation and gender identity. And people in the LGBT community felt that they were being discriminated against in housing, in credit, jury duty, um, employment. Um, and they wanted to amend that so that they would be a protected class. Uh, today, the Equality Act is dead. And it had been introduced in Congress for 20 years. It had passed the House of Representatives and it was going to the Senate. Now in the Senate, because of our coalition of individuals, our Jewish friends, our Mormon friends, our Catholic friends, um, our Seventh-day Adventist friends, our black churches uh, and pastors, um, the evangelical movement, um, we said, look, there's a lot of flaws with the Equality Act. And it is going to reverse the coercion, not any longer depending on your orientation or your gender, but because of your religious beliefs, and that is anti-American. We worked, uh, we have worked for the last eight years uh, with Congress to make sure that the Equality Act could not pass. And that has been accomplished. 
what has happened is a, in a positive problem solving way is that the Congress now sees that if they want to help LGBTQ Americans, um, they will also have to make sure that religious liberty is protected. That has been one of the significant outgrowths of our work to quash the Equality Act and to uh, indicate that it, they may, it may well be that LGBTQ people need to be protected, but not at the expense of religious belief. Um, recently, there was a, a story uh, in the public press with, with a, a prominent uh, Democrat, uh, Tammy Duckworth, uh, I mean, sorry, Tammy Baldwin, and Susan Collins. And if you had said 10 years ago that Tammy Baldwin, the, the proponent of the Equality Act in the Senate, would say that religious liberty was a crucial part of passing legislation, no one would imagine it. But today, they do. And I think I'd, I'd like to cautiously predict that if there is LGBTQ legislation in Congress, it will always be paired with religious liberty convictions. And so I'm hearing you say, I think that um, the navigation, the problem solving that actually makes your blood run fast in a good way yes. is, is acknowledging that there are changes that properly can be made in the law for people who who believe they have been displaced or diminished with the existing legal framework, but that you're you're saying it cannot happen, uh, or, or or you can't just drive to that destination, ignoring the impacts on existing uh, frameworks for religious liberty, and and so that here's the, yeah, here's the, what I think the win has been, Jim, and it's not no no win is forever, you know. Yes, I mean, yes, I, mean yes, I say yes. that humbly. I'll just, but the, the win is this, that when we talk about how, uh, well, let's say it this way, all, all of us have heard that Christians are bigots, that Christians only want to discriminate. And so it was almost untouchable that uh, a person in Congress who was a progressive would never want to talk about religion because you're, you're now defending those bigots, those people that discriminate. And the work of this religious coalition has been to say, no, can we reframe the question? Mm -hmm. It's not whether you're a bigot. It is whether you want people to flourish. Let's look at the facts. Are there places where people have been discriminated who are in the LGBT community because of employment? All you have to do is look at the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has said, in the case of Bostock versus Clayton County, that LGBTQ people were discriminated against in employment. And in fact, they have remedied that by passing a law that now in the United States, the word sex doesn't just mean male and female, it means also sexual orientation and gender identity. Well, if you're in Congress, you know about the Bostock case, the Supreme Court has already ruled on that. As Christians, we can't ignore that the Supreme Court has made inroads for LGBTQ people to protect them in employment situations. But Christians have also been discriminated against in employment situations. And so what we say to the Congress is, if you want to make sure that one group in society is protected, mm -hmm. make sure all people are protected. And, and here's been the really change of heart. Um, maybe some of your listeners will remember that a marriage became legal with a two, a, a new definition. Not marriage is not just between males and females. The marriage can be between us for people with same sex orientation. In that case, though, um, the 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 court said people who hold a different view, like Christian colleges, that the Bible's uh, standard is that marriage is between a man and a woman, um, and that males and females were created. Those are now countercultural. But that Supreme Court case said people who hold a traditional understanding of marriage and gender are not unreasonable. They are not bigots. They are not looking to hurt other people. They hold a different opinion. That idea is being um, infused into the legislation mm -hmm. of Congress because Christians are saying we're not opposed to the LGBTQ community being treated fairly. It just cannot be at the expense of Christians. 
And and that is so fundamental back to your role in the CCCU, to the operation and the the future of a Christian campus. Because yes. the, the ownership of a traditional value system or an orthodox system yeah. uh, and the ability to flourish uh, hinges on that acknowledgement that there are rights here also that need to be respected. But then what did you what would you say to the person who who responds to that? Because it all it sounds so reasonable, I don't think it is, but I mean what the person who says but wait a minute. What about that school that says uh, we don't let people of African descent to attend? Or there's uh, a school that on some religious premise uh, is discriminatory in ways that our culture almost universally would say that's reprehensible. What do you say to the abuse of that religious freedom, so to speak? Mm-hmm. Well, um, I'm such a believer in the rule of law, and I'm very pro supporting our courts. You don't always agree with a court opinion. Of course, people did not agree with Roe v. Wade, and Mm -hmm. people agree with Dobbs, Mm -hmm. uh, same court. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, when you get an opinion that you don't agree with, you use the system to bring up sets of facts so that those things can change. So um, there's a hierarchy, uh, basically, of things that are going to remain inviolate in the non-discrimination based on race is inviolate. So if a college said, well, our Bible tells us that, you know, we can't educate people who are not white, uh, the Supreme Court would say, well, we've decided when it's that rule and your religious beliefs, the rule around race is going to be superior. It's going to trump your your religious view. Yes. That's and on, on what we've been trying to say in, in terms of gender, sexual orientation and gender identity is that that should not trump religious beliefs. Mm-hmm. There, of course, is a movement to say, yes, religious beliefs that, that uh, do not affirm uh, gay marriage and gay lifestyle, that's somehow un-American and therefore you shouldn't fund those people, you shouldn't give them protections. And what my organization does is says we are going to have a seat at every table where that's being discussed. And we are going to use the law and the facts to show that Christians are not um, discriminating against uh, individuals. They are practicing sincerely held beliefs. And the Constitution, of course, pr- um, protects that. And uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a constant vigilance. And it's a constant putting forth the best of Christianity so that when there are differences, you can want flourishing for people you disagree with. Uh, take a think of it. We we allow gambling to go on. Uh, we we allow a lot allow a lot of things that you would say, boy, as a Christian, I'm not going to participate. And this is one of those things that, in terms of human sexuality, you, say, you know, we don't want to participate that in regarding that. But there may be other people in America in a democratic society where people have a lot of different beliefs where the government is going to allow some of those things to happen. So much of uh, this illustration about your work has has been illustrated through the LGBTQ, uh, shall we say, issues that the country faces. And it's so much uh, in the news. It's so much in everybody's life. And uh, by that, I mean, everyone knows somebody or has a story or has some point of view wherever they land on the continuum. And... Uh, it's certainly a, an issue that impacts public policy as well as uh, education and so on. Uh, I'm, I just have to say, I'm always reluctant or I'm, I'm, I'm in a pl- place where I'm often asked questions about LGBTQ issues and my views and our, our church's views and so on. And I, I'm always reluctant to, to address it homosexuality, let's say, or same gender attraction alone, or or gender dysphoria or transgender uh, sense alone, that human sexuality is a complex weave. And we all have boundaries, don't we? And we all have values, don't we? And there are some things that uh, everyone has a line. They, they may think they're completely inclusive, but everyone has a line, don't they, about what mm-hmm. they think is appropriate and inappropriate. And uh, in that context, uh, the conversation sometimes changes because people sometimes prefer just to talk about one little slice of the pie. But there are a lot of things that we wouldn't, you know, a, a Christian university that might say, 
uh, we don't care what your gender is. <laughs> we, we're not for uh, sexual relationships outside of marriage. Now, no, no one's quarreling with that boundary, even though in the popular culture, that is quite widely embraced, let's say, as normative these days. But there is a culture on a campus that is alleged to a biblical worldview that says, no, no, that's not part of our campus. And I think right. you're, you're arguing the same kind of question here. There are just certain ways in which the management of our sexual beings and how we express ourselves sexually uh, is a right. really deeply interwoven concept, isn't it, with theology and it philosophy. And, um, and it's a mystery, too. I mean, the, the background, the origins, the causal factors, all of that is still a mystery in many ways, no matter how people have landed in their own conclusions about it. When you come down to the facts or the science, it's not always a straight line. Having given my little <laughs> two cents worth there, how because you're engaged in that so often, and I know that many of the schools you represent are constantly on the firing line on this subject, how do you help encourage uh, schools? My alma mater, for instance, right now is, is in quite the weeds on this particular front line of thought and dialogue and debate in the CCCU. Uh, how is that engaged? Or are there ideas or frameworks that you like to put forward to people in our churches or our schools? You know, I really love your framework there, Jim, of, of it's not just one issue. It's how we see a lot of issues put together. And we, we read the Bible in such a way that the, uh, and believe that the Bible has given us instructions for our best life. And our best life doesn't include sex outside of marriage. And uh, you say that to any 18 or 22 year old on the street, they go, well, come on, it's just consent. What, what do you mean? Yes, if it's uh, consensual, you, got, it's appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean that, that you would actually uh, really love someone and, and maybe even uh, desire to have sex outside, sex before you're married and you're choosing not to do that? That is something that is just a witness uh, to the surrender and love you have for God to align your life with that that good advice, uh, that good um, command in the Bible. Um, not being drunk. Uh, most of our campuses are dry, right? And so, uh, one of the things that students will say about a Christian college campus is that we have good, clean fun. There is so much fun that happens on a Christian college campus in very little. And I would never say there's no drinking on a Christian college campus. I was in student life. Um, <laughs> But I would say that the majority, the vast majority of um, interactions on a Christian college campus does not include alcohol. And just think about how much better that is. You're not worried about your friend getting sick. You're not worried about that person driving drunk. You're not worried about uh, the fact that they may not have the judgment they need, right? All of those kinds of guidelines that the Bible gives us as human beings are so important. Um, uh, to treat the least of them like the first of them, right? Um, there is a, uh, there is a, there is less bullying on Christian college campuses. There is less harassment on Christian college campuses. Um, sexual assault is lower on Christian college campuses. I mean, we're human, so it's not going all together. But because we're living fruit of the spirit, sort of, I you know, um, standard, you have less of those things. So when um, when it comes to uh, same-sex marriage relationship, the, the rules apply on an undergrad campus to all, all people. Um, we're not going to have sex outside of marriage, and that means for gay or straight students. But we do care for students that have special sets of questions about their lives. Um, and that could be um, maybe you uh, have come from a, a, a trauma situation in your family that has nothing to do with sexual orientation or gender identity. The school is there for you. Maybe you've come with um, a set of learning difficulties, but the school is there for you. Maybe you've had some mental health challenges in your family or in your own personal life, and the school is there for you. Think about if you're struggling or if you're wondering about your sexual orientation or gender identity, the school should be there for you. We should not be afraid of talking with, counseling with, understanding the student who may come in with those questions. And addressing them in the context of the whole of human life That's right. uh, is, is a fair approach. And 
And so that's true in a local church also. I mean, I was a pastor for 40 years. Uh, If your church is not a safe place to ask these questions and to be heard and respected, even as you ask them or even come to a different conclusion, if your church is not safe to talk about it, uh, your church will be left by the curb uh, as the world drives by because everyone else is talking about it. And I would even argue that uh, the one who made us... Yes should have voices, uh, our voices, in the conversation, just as you've talked about other things, that we shouldn't be afraid to talk about it and and to love people through to conclusions. And even if they land in a different place, our sharing and thinking has a space in the conversation should be there. And, yes. and I guess college should be like that. I've sent four sons to Anderson University, and uh, which is one of our church well schools. <laughs> Part of, yes, and when I think about multiplying the four times four years times the tuition, <laughs> there there is an investment. Uh, yes, there uh, is. And but you know what? Each of my sons has uh, come through that experience, and they have they have established themselves professionally. I mean, there is they have all achieved great success in their careers. My oldest son is 41, my youngest is 33. But they've each found their way to successful place. Their faith journeys uh, have also been hugely informed. They grew up in a pastor's house and by this school which was in their neighborhood. They've not all landed exactly where I would hope they would land as they are walking through their journey. But I think the questions have certainly been asked. And yes. the and the answers have been informed. And while um, I might have a son who may not be in church every Sunday like I like him to be, he does not want anyone speaking negatively about that church <laughs> because right. there's a certain kind of uh, right. respect about it, even though there may be some difference of opinion. My point of all of that is that a an investment in a Christian education, a Christian higher ed, uh, even as you reflected on uh, K to 12, uh, that's a whole nother, well, let's do a whole nother podcast about that. But uh, a, a Christian in higher education uh, has so much merit in helping people understand the world. And uh, well, I, I won't disclose uh, personal stories with my children. I shouldn't, that's their story to tell. But I've, I've, I'm impressed sometimes when they say to me in their secular professional working environments, how so many people around them do not understand this huge swath of the country or even understand uh, a point of view because they just haven't had any traffic in it. They, they just have any exposure, really. And, we're, and we assume a lot when you grow up in a church world, you assume a lot about the world outside, which can't be assumed anymore. And how valuable it is, how uh, my sons are valuable in their working place. Of course, one's a pastor, so he's in a church world. But <laughs> how how they ha- they are being recognized for their value in bringing insight uh, to the table in a conversation that other people can't imagine. And, and that's uh, often what you have referred to here, Shirley. You're, mm-hmm. you're at a different level uh, at the centers of power, bringing insight to conversation. That said, we all know that Christian education uh, and the private liberal arts Christian school uh, faces strong challenges. I mean, every school faced an a excruciating um, journey through the pandemic if you have a residential campus and nobody's there and you have to keep it up. But there's, I mean, there's, there's that, which is not limited to Christian liberal arts schools, but everyone went through that. But there's also just the cost. It tends to be more expensive often than, let's say, just going to your local community college or public university. Uh, there is the framing, the cultural framing. And, and I mean, there's a lot of dynamics that challenged the viability of a private Christian liberal arts school. I found actually uh, an article in Christianity Today, maybe you've seen this, from 1970, from April of 1970. And the, and the headline of the article in CT was The Plight of the Christian Liberal Arts College. It was written by a guy from Westmont College in Santa Barbara. And he was describing in 1970 the sea change in culture, maybe in a prophetic way, that was daring and challenging schools grounded in what he described as Christian theism and in the competitive marketplace, how that was casting a long shadow on the future of schools like his own Westmont. And I mean, that's 1970. That's the year I, I went to college. I started as a freshman 
<laughs> at Warner Pacific then. Uh, I'm just saying there's, there's a long trajectory, but today we've come to a really a pivotal place, I think. What's, what's your forecast? Uh, the prophetess yourself, what would you say about the future of Christian higher educational liberal schools? Uh, and um, liberal educational education. Yeah. Well, um, I think the future is bright. I think the future has um, opportunities for adaptability in terms of course delivery, in terms of really honing uh, your distinctives of, as an institution. So it's not going to be without its challenges. But here's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote um, Pete Weiner. Uh, he's a columnist. Uh, he's uh, written for both the Atlantic and the New York Times. And he recently wrote an article in the Deseret News. And he said, uh, in important aspects, Christian colleges and universities now model what it means to be a university better than secular counterparts. There is less fragmentation. There is more theological education. They have richer and more diverse intellectual culture. Faith is taken seriously. They are better educated for the world's problems. And he was giving the example that there may be actually a renaissance coming where people are tired of a narrow, um, politically driven uh, secular education, and are looking for what we call um, soul crafting for a student's life. And uh, institutions that are in the CCCU have the ability to, for instance, take this, Jim, the idea of human rights. If you read the letter from Martin um, Luther King Jr. from a Birmingham jail, he gives uh, the undergirding, the foundation for why uh, people's uh, human dignity is a universal human right. And that cannot be understood apart from uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's faith. So the, the student of tomorrow, the family of tomorrow, I don't think is going to want education void of morality or void of spirituality. And so I think that the Christian colleges is going to be that place that provides the societal hope for a better kind of place in this world. So um, there may be institutions that because of enrollment, uh, they merge or they say we've had our season. Um, but I think the value of a Christian education is only going to rise. Would you say, and I, I may be leading the witness here, that without Christian colleges and universities, our civilization is doomed to a long, slow slide? I mean, is it, is it that important that what yeah. happens there informs the larger world with a necessary peace that cannot otherwise be found? I, I have formulated in the last year in my own mind that Christian higher education next to the church is the hope of a flourishing world. Uh, Christian higher education campuses will become uh, the remnant of what people believe is important in the human experience. And I don't believe it's by accident. And you know, the God of the universe over the thousands of years that humans have been alive, you, you have an ebb and flow, right? And um, I, I believe that God has blessed the educational process infused by faith in order to preserve the world. Hmm. And that's uh, no small thing. I think no. many people imagine it's almost incidental on the periphery if, they're, if you don't think it through. But right. when you think about 500,000 students, as you've named already, uh, it's right. a small proportion of, of the world's population, but 500,000 is a big number. And, and that's, that's today. <laughs> I mean, that's right. replicated each year uh, and right. generation by generation, the impacts of that and, and the, the voices, the brains, the hearts, the souls, the philosophy and the value systems that those students uh, enter into the mainstream of life with is mm -hmm. so necessary. And without that, where would we be? 
Uh, where would be the checks? I mentioned Francis Collins earlier because he, the reason I was in a room with him was he was speaking to a group of church leaders and he was speaking about medical ethics, as you had hinted before. He said, the science of medicine is advancing so rapidly that it's presenting ethical quandaries. And if the church doesn't speak, there are no guardrails. And where will we be? The, the necessary uh, understanding. And of course, that requires more than just an elementary education to speak right. into medical ethics. And our Christian schools can help us get there, for instance. And that's the challenge for Christian colleges and universities. It is to say, where is Christ-like thinking needed most? So I would like Christian colleges and universities to be at the forefront of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. I would love Christian colleges and universities to be in, in the forefront of medical ethics. Um, I would love Christian colleges and universities to be at the forefront of life and death decision making. Now, it may very well be that we take that 18 to 22 year old and they go on to graduate school and they are at a school that's at the forefront mm -hmm. of artificial yes, intelligence. Yes. And they bring their Christian worldview and influence those discussions in those graduate programs. So I, I actually don't think that we need to be all need to be Christian college and universities. Um, I think what we need to do, though, is make sure that we are east in every area of life. I recently, uh, I'm friends with the Veritas Forum. Uh, that's a wonderful organization. They just got a very large grant to identify Christian faculty in secular campuses mm -hmm. um, so that they can bolster their work and witness to the graduate students who are coming to then learn and be mentored under them. Now, isn't that a great idea? Yes. Right? We're not in competition with each other. We're forming an ecosystem. Like, remember those old terrariums? I don't know if they still do terrariums. <laughs> well, how about an ant farm? But anyway, yes. <laughs> 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 All right, so what we want to build is some ecosystems where um, God, in his providence, puts people to impact the world for, for goodness. And that is going to be on a secular campus. It's going to be on a Christian college campus. And what Christians have to do is get behind those kinds of good ideas. Shirley, I, I, I've listened uh, to your case uh, already for the question I'm going to ask you. So I'm going to ask it again. I'm not, I'm asking it for the first time, but I, I think I can predict an answer. But if you were speaking today to a family, uh, parents, let's say, and they are helping their son or daughter navigate a choice about higher education, they're wrestling with, should I go over here to this school or that one? What would you say to them in your elevator speech about, no, you need to look at one of these Christian campuses? I always say first, pray hard and trust the Holy Spirit's leading. And then I say, here is the advantage of the Christian college. You are going to give your son or daughter the spiritual foundation for a lifetime. You are going to give your son or daughter excellent academics that are going to be viewed through the lens of faith. Your son or daughter is going to form lifelong friendships and mentors because of the people they are going to learn from and study with. And you are never going to regret the investment in the spiritual life of your son or daughter, because that is an eternal investment. Shirley Hookshire, we are so glad that you found your way to the uh, president's chair at the CCCU. And uh, I'm just saying, if 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 you're taking any cases on the side where you just want to still keep that practice of law going, let me know, because I've got some things I'd love for you to argue for <laughs> on our behalf. <laughs> Thank oh, you. Well, Jim, it's been a delight to have this, have this conversation. Um, it's just flown by because I have just found your questions in your analysis and your listening ear to be so enjoyable today. So thank you for the invitation. I'm honored. Wow. You, you've been most excellent company, and I completely comprehend how not only people in your own church family might want to sit at table with you, but how someone, as you've described, who may span a spectrum of A to Z in their thinking, who may not be coincident with you on a lot of your thoughts, still want to be at the table with you.
because you are very articulate and also uh, informed and just excellent company. That's the Lord's doing. Thanks for making it so. Well, I do love I do love a good meal at a table. <laughs> all right. Well, all right then. Don't come back to Indiana without uh, giving us a call. We'll make sure that happens. I will do that for sure. All right. Thank you so much. Thank Jim. you. And if any of you would like to know more about the work of the CCCU, or you want to know more about all that to say, we encourage you to reach out and touch base with us at allthattosay.org. Always glad to hear from you. Thanks, Shirley. We'll see you soon. Bye now. Bye bye. For more information, visit allthattosay.org. Thank you for joining the conversation. Don't forget to like and subscribe.